I think Vietnam was the probably the greatest single error that America has made in its national history. Uh, Vietnam, I think, has at least for a period diverted our attention from the central issue of how the world is to organize itself to prevent World War III. Vietnam uh, is still with us. Uh, it has divided the consensus that carried American foreign policy through a generation. It created the uh, doubts about American judgment, about American credibility, and American power. But for me, the greatest legacy of the war in Vietnam is that I will never believe my government again. Thirty years after the first American died in Vietnam, the last Americans were leaving, waiting on the U.S. Embassy roof to be flown to safety. The long war was ending in the defeat of the South Vietnamese state that America had supported for two decades. What kind of peace finally was at hand? What would be the meaning of peace? To many South Vietnamese, peace meant the end of their way of life. The Americans helped 65,000 to escape in the last weeks of war. Thousands more, families of officials, businessmen, and others with close links to the Americans, fled in terror. I was 14 years old when I left Saigon in 75. At 6 o'clock, we heard on the radio that the soldier have to give up, so the communists will come in for peace. My father didn't believe that, so he decided to go no matter what. It was like a movie to me, because we didn't know what's going on. I was so afraid. The communists uh, stopped us and asked where we would be going. But my father had to bribe them by giving a diamond watch. I saw my father slip his watch to the, uh, the comrade's hand. So the guy was smiling, and he was satisfied. So he let us go. To the North Vietnamese soldiers who took Saigon, peace meant the end of the anti-colonial war that had started 30 years before. When we arrived at the palace, I walked up to the second floor, where members of the puppet administration had gathered. Wang Van Min then stepped out of the crowd and said, I've been waiting for you since early this morning in order to turn over the government to you. To which I replied at once, there is no need to talk of turning over the government to us. Your entire administration has collapsed. People cannot turn over what they do not have in their own hands. Your only choice is to surrender. To many Saigonese, peace brought a glimmer of hope. The South Vietnamese government was really not good, not good for us before, and maybe now it's the change. And at least we can see our country now with the full length from north to south and no more war, no more hostility. Therefore, we came out the street to see what uh, communists look like. And we saw uh, the communist army, they, they're really nice and they smile and with us, we saw a forest of flags and slogan and a picture of um, Ho Chi Minh. So everybody uh, like a family, big family now, no more. The communists uh, use uh, a lot of beautiful words. For example, nothing is precious than freedom and independence. Now we are free and independence and uh, we can 
visit Hanoi, maybe we can know the whole country. Then uh, after that, uh, day by day, we re realize a lot of terrible things. 130,000 refugees from Indochina made their way to Guam and on to America by the end of 1975. By 1976, the flow of refugees had slowed and the war had faded into a kind of limbo. America saluted the country's 200th birthday in a joyful outpouring of patriotic celebration. Sailing ships from around the world assembled in the Hudson River to do honor to the nation on the 4th of July. The confusion and discord among Americans that had marked the Vietnam era were nowhere in evidence. But the bicentennial was also a presidential election year. As the major parties positioned themselves, they offered conflicting judgments on the meaning of Vietnam. The Democratic Party's platform plank on Asia stated, the Vietnam War has taught us the folly of becoming militarily involved where our vital interests were not at stake. The President of the United States and Mrs. Ford. Stressing America's vital strategic interests in Asia, the Republican plank blamed the Democratic Congress for refusing adequate military aid to Indochina, thus allowing the communists to win. During the campaign, the candidates clashed repeatedly over how to deal with the young men who had avoided military service. I gave, in September of 1974, an opportunity for all draft evaders, all deserters, to come in voluntarily, clear their records by earning an opportunity to restore their good citizenship. I don't think we should go any further. Governor Carter? I don't advocate amnesty. I advocate pardon. There's a difference, in my opinion, uh, and in accordance with the ruling of the Supreme Court and according to the definition in the dictionary. Amnesty means that, that, you, uh, what, that what you did was right. Pardon means that what you did, whether it's right or wrong, you're forgiven for it. More than 200,000 men were accused of draft evasion during the Vietnam era. President Carter gave them a blanket pardon on his first day in office. Among the first to come home from Canada was Anthony Rodriguez. Uh, I see the, the whole Vietnam issue as a very divisive issue in the country. And maybe this is really the first step towards reconciling some of the different ideas. Mr. Carter should have waited a bit more than uh, one day to do this, if he was going to do it at all. There are other priorities he should have set to, to heal the wounds of war, if that's what he really wanted to do. There are 1,300 families or more who don't know where their sons are. Uh, I'm talking specifically about them uh, missing in action. Also, there, there are Vietnam veterans who are unemployed uh, and, and who did serve this country honorably and who are wounded, uh, uh, who are not receiving their rights and, and things of this nature. And I feel that the first priority should have been given to these people, to these men, and then maybe we could talk about the others. Carter himself deeply wanted to have some major symbolic actions of reconciliation. He had pledged during the campaign to the League of MIA Families that he would send a delegation to Hanoi to pursue the search for the accounting of MIA families. In March of 77, he sent this team to Vietnam, headed by Leonard Woodcock and Mike Mansfield. I think it was, at best, a very difficult road to create a reconciliation between the United States and Vietnam after the horrendous, lacerating events of the previous decade. In the course of these meetings, the Vietnamese have informed us that they are giving us the remains of 12 American servicemen. They will be flown out of Vietnam with the commission. We welcome this positive step by the Vietnamese government. We have also established a mechanism for the provision of additional information on our missing men. The League of MIA families had a powerful emotional issue which grabbed the souls of many Americans beyond the immediate families.
We want an accounting. We want them to stop dribbling out remains 11 at a time any time it's politically expedient to suddenly find some to deliver to a congressional delegation. We want them to put some priority on getting the accounting and doing it now. Uh, there were 2,500 of the Americans who died in Vietnam who remained unaccounted for at the end of the war. Now that's 4% of the Americans who died in Vietnam compared to the 22% of Americans who died in Korea and 22% of the Americans who died in World War II whose bodies never were recovered. That's a remarkable percentage and a tribute to the determination and skill of the United States military in recovering the bodies of their dead. However, pilots went down in the north and other people were lost in the south whose bodies were never recovered. If the Vietnamese are so anxious to get normalized relations and trade, then let them do what President Carter supposedly has this big human rights thing going on. If they're so concerned about human rights, why don't they get the Vietnamese to cooperate on the humanitarian issue of the accounting? In April 1977, Vietnamese Premier Pham Van Dong arrived in Paris, where Vietnam and America had agreed to talk about establishing diplomatic relations separate from the MIA issue. His arrival fired political passions among the refugees. At a press conference, Dong expressed hope for better relations with America. Voyez-vous, je suis, j'ai été, et je serai toujours optimiste. <laughs> The Premier's optimism may have been linked to a letter from an American president. The Vietnamese took a position in 1977, an idiotic position, in my view, a self-defeating position, which the American public understandably and instantaneously rejected, that the United States had to pay up the money promised to the Vietnamese by Nixon in a letter he had sent them on February 1st, 1973, four and three quarter billion dollars of credits and grants. Now, that letter was secret at the time. Nixon has subsequently disavowed it in effect by saying that it was linked to actions of the Vietnamese which never took place. And in any case, there was no, t no possible, uh, a po no possibility that the American public, the Congress, was go were going to give money to the Vietnamese. It just was not in the cards. We have always, for the last 25 years, op opposed Vietnam's entry into the United Nations. This year, we did not oppose it. And now Vietnam will be a member of the world community in the United Nations. I don't have any apology to make about that action. I am not in favor of the United States paying any money or reparations to Vietnam, however. America was not in a mood to help an undefeated and unrepentant enemy. In the fall of 1978, I continued under presidential instructions my talks in New York with Nguyen Co Tak. Uh, we met several times, and in the second of our meetings here in New York, Tak dropped the demand the Vietnamese had maintained for the previous three years that the United States pay war reparations or aid to Vietnam as the price of recognition. When he dropped that demand, he thought that the way was now clear for immediate progress. But the boat people were pouring out into Southeast Asian waters, into the South China Sea, and there was a worldwide uproar. And on November 2nd, while we were in the process of reviewing what we should do, the Vietnamese and the Russians signed a treaty of peace and friendship with considerable ceremony in Moscow between Brezhnev and Pham Van Dai. This series of events made us decide that we ought to, ought to go slow. The United States of America and the People's Republic of China have agreed to recognize each other and to establish diplomatic relations as of January the 1st, 1979. The normalization of relations between the United States and China has no other purpose than this, 
the advancement of peace. We, when we went into office, very deliberately sat down and defined for ourselves about 10 objectives for the four years. And I remember quite vividly that the fifth objective was that we would normalize relations with China during the first term, and we even set for ourselves the objective of normalizing relations by 1979. When we began to cope with the American-Chinese relationship, which required a great deal of domestic effort, we were conscious of the fact that China and Vietnam were at loggerheads. And they were in a condition of severe hostility with some limited fighting. Not of the kind of fighting that developed later in February, March of 1979, but still, in effect, shooting. And thus, it was out of the question to try to normalize relations with both at the same time. It would also diminish the importance of the new American-Chinese relationship. And therefore, I made certain that we moved in a deliberate fashion, purposeful fashion, in normalizing relations with China, but that we would put aside, while doing that, any improvement of relations with Vietnam. Viewed from Hanoi, America's reversal seemed ironic. America had gone to war in Vietnam to contain Chinese communist expansion. Now, to please China, it was refusing to make peace with Vietnam. Vietnam needed all the aid it could get. The war may have cost as many as two million Vietnamese dead and four and a half million wounded north and south, one-tenth of the country's entire population. Vast areas had been battlefields, devastated by three times the total tonnage of bombs dropped in all of World War II. The Vietnamese peasantry had endured 30 years of increasingly sophisticated warfare supplied by the big powers on both sides. While pursuing their aim of national reunification, the Hanoi leadership had built a Soviet-style state in North Vietnam. For tonight's news, please join us in watching the National Conference of Veterans and War Heroes Families, the development of production, and the program of Little Flowers. Peace did not mean prosperity. As in wartime, workers were required to devote their days off from regular jobs to tasks of reconstruction. But they were tired of making sacrifices and longed for the fruits of peace. Since the end of the war, without all those bombs dropping down on us, we have lost much of our former fervor. We now complain of housing shortages and food shortages. But during the war years, you never heard anyone complaining about anything at all. Peace had brought a new name to Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. It was plagued by uncounted numbers of prostitutes and drug addicts, two million refugees from the countryside, and 700,000 unemployed. Tough northern officials, determined to build a communist society, took over from their former Viet Cong comrades. Southerners quickly lost their illusions. Some months later, we soon realized that really the Communist Party, they tried to make the people become robots to serve for any interest of the Communist Party. When the communists took over uh, South uh, Vietnam, I uh, didn't go to Tix anymore because I can see that they had a lot of discrimination uh, policy. So uh, um, I uh, stay home and try to plan with my family to escape because the situation uh, in, Viet in South Vietnam is worse and worse. The bloodbath predicted by many, mass executions of political opponents, did not take place in Vietnam. But one and a half million Southerners were forced to resettle in new economic zones. The zones were remote, and the land was often poor. Many found the work too hard and the distractions too few. Some drifted back into Saigon, increasing the numbers of those who felt they had no future in Vietnam. 
The new government oppressed the Chinese business community for both racial and economic reasons, and they interned more than 200,000 political suspects in so-called re-education camps in the first 12 months of peace. Right up to April 1975, I was uh, called and report to the uh, communist post, and they sent me to the uh, re-education camp. Like all the camp, uh, they have uh, ten, le ten lessons. That means, you know, they uh, introduce uh, themselves, you know, what is the communist doing for our country, and who is the U.S. And the last lesson, I think, was uh, uh, Communist Russia is a great country, is our, uh, like, uh, heaven. So first, we trust them, um, and, um, and we thought that, you know, maybe, you know, after, you know, a few lessons, uh, we can come back, you know, to our family and live with a normal life, right? So all of us, you know, we try to study and, and try to trust them. The physical condition is survive day by day, and uh, many people was killed and, and by, you know, disease. Because the uh, condition is, you know, there's no way you can describe here because of the people that starving. One time I, uh, I, I start to catch, catch, you know, one frog for eating. And, you know, one of the, you know, um, police, you know, communist police, he saw that and they pushed me into a very small room and they make, um, they make something like a locker by one piece of wood with a five hole, one horn for the neck, two horn for hands, and two horn for feet. And they um, push all of my body in there and they lock it up and they left me like that for one week. After that, right, for two days, right, I, I couldn't stand up, right, because um, all of my body, you know, just like, um, a roll, you know, something like that for one week. At the moment that I escaped from the uh, uh, re-education camp, I, I made my mind that I have to escape from the country, all price. But the manage to do that is uh, the matter of money and, um, and the chance. Life in post-war Vietnam was grim. It was worse in neighboring Cambodia. Thousands of Cambodian refugees were escaping with stories of almost unbelievable horrors. In Cambodia, peace meant death. Now I talk about uh, the, the, the killing in my hometown. Is, uh, they kill all the soldiers, even you are private soldier, the teachers, and all the educated people. Uh, nurses, all, every, everybody, even their own people, their own cadre, the comrade, when they think they are not good, they arrest them. Nobody knows what's going on, they just arrest them, beat them along the road and disappear. The Cambodian communists, the Khmer Rouge, had seized power in a shattered society in 1975. Led by Pol Pot, they drove the population into vast agricultural collectives. Cambodia drew closer to China and increasingly hostile to Vietnam. Fearing communist China, communist Vietnam invaded communist Cambodia. Nationalism was stronger than ideology. The Vietnamese intervened to unseat Pol Pot. They also put an end to the Holocaust. My first trip inside Cambodia occurred while I was working on Cambodian refugee and famine relief programs. I made a second trip to Cambodia to uh, photograph the evidence that remained of what had happened under the Khmer Rouge. At the Chung Ek mass gravesite, victims' skulls were still blindfolded and their arms still bound. Later, the remains were collected in memorial sheds where Buddhist ceremonies were held. At Tonle Batif, a former school served as the execution center. Another district level execution center was established at Tom On. There was essentially a three tiered structure of uh, murder by government in Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. At the top of the pyramid, so to speak, was a prison execution extermination system where 
people who were presumed to be opponents, enemies of the regime, traitors to the revolution, were individually executed. Places like uh, Tool Slang, 15,000 people were individually executed and only seven uh, survived from that. It was a former school and a hallway was knocked between the individual uh, rooms and small cinder block cells uh, were constructed where prisoners were held bound by leg irons that were cemented into the floor. When the Vietnamese invaded, they did so so quickly that uh, essentially the Khmer Rouge jailers and prison officials ran off, uh, fled for their lives and left behind scores of thousands of pages of documentation that had been utilized at this prison execution uh, center. And it's very surprising that you would have in a, an illiterate peasant country a bureaucracy of death that was that efficient and that uh, developed uh, literally in Asian Auschwitz, as it were. And you have photographs of individuals taken after they were dead or nearly dead that could also be sent on to party higher-ups to show that these traitors to the revolution had been killed and they were not being harbored. As the revolution failed to work, they kept looking about for who was sabotaging it now because they had figured that they had eliminated the enemies to the revolution, but still things weren't working, so they sought scapegoats. You have essentially in three and a half years of Khmer Rouge rule somewhere between one and a half and two and a half million out of seven million people dying uh, through a combination of execution, uh, induced starvation, exhaustion, and disease. Five weeks after the defeat of the Khmer Rouge, China sent an army of 200,000 across the border to punish Vietnam for its invasion of Cambodia. Once again, Vietnamese civilians fled from gunfire. Once again, peace meant war in Southeast Asia. The Chinese withdrew in four weeks but continued to harass Vietnam, while Vietnam strove to consolidate its domination of Cambodia. The flow of refugees became a torrent as the tension increased. Vietnamese and ethnic Chinese risked their lives in escaping from Vietnam. Thousands died. All suffered hardships. Pirates operating off the coast of Thailand preyed mercilessly on the boat people. Uh, we come from uh, Vietnam. How many days? Uh, 15 days. 15 days? Yeah. How many people? 19. 19 people? Two, uh, two, uh, two children. Two women. Two baby. And, uh, to woman and uh, to baby, he start to, to die, but we try to, to, to make some rice. How about the pirates? No pirates? Pirates, pirates. Ah, uh, pirates, yeah. We can... So can, I, can I see, uh, can I tell the truth? Yes. Yeah. Uh, everybody here, he, Everything is off. Uh, ow. What happened? Take off. They took it. Yeah. How many times did they uh, did they attack you? Actually, one day and a half. Did you eat uh, yesterday? Today? Nine, nine, nine day. Nine day. Nine day. Today, we uh, this man gave me some food. He gave you some food. Yeah. And we come here. And before that. You don't no, have food? No, nothing. No food for nine days? Yeah, no, nine yeah. no water. No water. No food. No food. Nearly two million Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Laotians fled into China from 1975 through 1983. 200,000 remain in Southeast Asian refugee camps because no country will accept them. Nguyen Mui and his family were among the fortunate ones. We left uh, Vietnam on the 21st January at 2 o'clock in the morning. When we 
uh, away from the coast, the ocean, the, they have no, not really wind. But when we are about 20 kilometers from the coast, the wind is very high. And uh, there is the big storm, a little bit big storm. All the children have seasick. We are very worried. Around us, all the night, all night, all the one color, the dark, the black. We planned this escape for a year. We know that it is the very dangerous, but we have no choice. We have only one choice, the choice between the freedom or the death. I got the news some, uh, some time in August that I, my family was uh, accepted to go to the States. Uh, we were very happy because uh, I, I think that I can manage to be there to give my children opportunity to grow. By the end of 1983, Nearly 700,000 Indochinese, mainly from Vietnam, had reached America. No other country had accepted so many. As they rebuild their lives in America, most look back in longing to their homeland. It's my hope that my, the regime in my country will change. That's mean that my country is not communist anymore. It is in my heart that I hope that, that that day will happen so that I can return to my country. Because our people, the Asiatic in general, or in the Vietnamese in particular, we, we were very tied to where we were born. I want to remain forever in Lang Son. After me, my children. And after my children, my grandchildren. Like the refugees, people in Vietnam also express strong attachment to their native land. No matter how many times the foreign invaders come and destroy this place, I will continue to rebuild and will continue to remain here forever. I'm not afraid. If I have to fight again, I will fight again. This is my native land. I love it here and will never leave it. So that's what I think. My hope is to build a socialist system in my country to bring happiness to the people and most importantly to keep our country unified, unified, unified. Not only in my lifetime does my country have to be kept unified, but also in the lives of my children, my grandchildren and their children after them. We will never allow any country, no matter how powerful, to encroach upon our country. I feel that I can never leave the Vietnamese people. I feel that I must help them in every way that I can. This is because my whole life and that which is most beautiful of my ideal are so closely connected with Vietnam. I can never leave her. All of us wanted to contribute to the development of our nation. Looking back, we can certainly see that there have been lost opportunities. If the French government and the various American administrations had been more reasonable, more understanding and more intelligent, then the war could have been avoided. And consequently, damages to the United States and to France could also have been avoided. We never wanted to have a war. Vietnam can be viewed in retrospect as the last and longest of the post-World War II colonial conflicts. It can be viewed as a civil war. It can also be viewed as an episode of the Cold War like Korea in the early 1950s. But whatever the view, it was a tragic war for the peoples of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Peace has left them poverty-stricken, oppressed, and almost entirely dependent on the Soviet Union. 
and communist Vietnam is still America's enemy. The war that was never declared has never ended. For many Americans, Vietnam the country, a real place inhabited by real people, has become Vietnam the lesson. What we should have learned from Vietnam, the exact opposite of what has happened to us, no more Vietnams. That accounts for Angola, Ethiopia, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iran today, name it. Until we know the enemy, know, uh, know our allies, know our friends, and then know ourselves, we better keep out of this dirty business. It's very dangerous. The only reason to go to war at any time uh, is to overthrow a government that's doing something you don't like. And if you announce at the outset that you're not going to overthrow the government, then so far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, you should come home immediately. Basically, we should uh, ask once, twice, ten times before we arrogate to ourselves the right to kill anybody in a foreign country in order to determine the government of that country as we see fit. And I think uh, a lesson to be learned is that uh, young men should not be sent to the battlefield unless the country is going to support them. The young men sent to the battlefields of Vietnam mainly went alone and returned alone, often to indifference, hostility, or silence. You know, you begin to see a lot of uh, uh, instant uh, insanity and, and brutality that uh, I don't think anybody prepared you for. And then one day, all of a sudden, you're back on this airplane uh, with stewardesses and people who are laughing and happy, and you're coming out of this freaky atmosphere, and uh, you land back in the United States of America, and nobody cares, nobody wants you to be in uniform. Uh, you get in a taxi, and off you go. You try and go home. The animosity was, even on the airplane flying out here, the animosity was there. People would, would shun you. The people wouldn't, uh, uh, would try to stay away from you. Not many people would even talk to you. We were not very well prepared to come home. When we came home, we found out there was a taboo. The taboo is you don't talk about having been in combat service or in Vietnam, and we won't ask you about it. It was a comfortable contract. In the uh, period right after Vietnam, we found that we had an army which was searching for a mission in conjunction with its role as part of the all of the forces of our national defense. We had an army in which we had lost the basic unison and cohesion that exists within organizations. We had lost our non-commissioned officer corps. There were questions being raised at that time as to why an army. After Vietnam, a reduced role for American forces was part of the Nixon Doctrine, which relied on heavily armed, dependent states to be extensions of American power abroad. Iran was a major example until Islamic revolutionaries overthrew the Shah's regime in early 1979. The strategic setback in Iran was compounded by a growing sense of national frustration in America. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. The Americans inside have been taken prisoner, and according to a student spokesman, will be held as hostages until the deposed Shah is returned from the United States, where he's receiving medical treatment for cancer. We have uh, uh, enough uh, people to fight with Americans, and if they fight with us, uh, they will lose it, like they lost in uh, Vietnam. This was the start of a 444-day ordeal. Five and a half months after the hostages were taken, a military operation to free them failed. The continuing spectacle of American impotence may have cost President Carter his re-election. On his last day in office, the hostages were freed. Their homecoming celebrations stirred painful memories in some Vietnam veterans. First of all, I want to make it very clear that we're happy that the hostages have come home. But we want the American people to know that Vietnam veterans had a very difficult and different homecoming than the hostages did. You know, they come back and uh, they're heroes to the people. Now, yet what did they really do? You know, they spent a year in captivity. A lot of guys here spent a lot, you know, a year in Vietnam went through a lot more. Hey, 
What about us? The humiliation in Iran brought public demands that America reassert its power. It also brought heightened public awareness of the human legacy of Vietnam. Of two and a half million who served in Southeast Asia, a substantial number, some estimate three quarters of a million, are still haunted by the experience. There are a lot of people who were bur burned during the war years and feel like um, they can't trust the government, they can't trust uh, the major institutions of the society, and so have retreated into a kind of if cynicism or a kind of mistrust of the major institutions and, and feel like, you know, it's not worth it. Why me? Why bother? Lots of times I get mad and I want the easy solution. In Vietnam, I learned that if you killed someone, they could never bother you again. And a lot of times over here, I'll get upset about stuff and I'll, I'll feel like going out and killing somebody. But now my intellect is in charge instead of my emotions. I know that if I do, I'm going to go to jail. So I'm really going to lose. I have a lot of stressed thoughts about uh, it's not over yet. You know, I was still, you know, like they say, is it a dream or is it Memorex or what? But I still, in my sleep, see these things going on every night. You know, I have, you know, I'm still... Uh, Still a little shaky over it. I haven't begun to settle down yet. You know, and it's, uh, it's a bad thing that happened. And, and you wonder why, you know, so many disabled vets have a hard time. Because nobody's treating, you know, what's bothering them. They're over their wounds. I mean, you get over your wounds fast. I, I, was, I was healthy three months after I'd been shot. But emotionally, it took me eight years. We were raised with the concept of heroics and uh, the John Wayne movies and all that, and I was raised with that. And I was looking at Vietnam, that I would never get hurt, that I would never be injured. That I was doing my duty, I was going there, and I was going to kill the commies, and I was going to come home. David Christian was the youngest lieutenant, then the youngest captain, and finally one of the most decorated soldiers in Vietnam. He received the Distinguished Service Cross, two Silver Stars, two Bronze Stars, seven Purple Hearts, and many other awards, all before he was 21 years old. Coming back to America, coming back to the world, we also, after years of suffering and frustration, trying to find jobs and do other different things, and having the American politicians turn their backs on these boys, come to find out that we were sprayed with this herbicide called Agent Orange, a poison, a dioxin poison. I was sitting in the hospital. I'd been in the hospital six months since last October, fighting every day for my life. And uh, I was just reading the Daily News. And on May 17th, there was a small article in there warning Vietnam veterans of possible cancer or genetic defects due to Agent Orange that was sprayed over in Vietnam. And I just put two and two together. I was a crew chief over there. And we flew missions in the same areas as, at the same time that they were defoliating. Being with the 20th Engineer Group over there, the engineers also defoliated areas around all the perimeters, and I was close to it all the time. No one ever told us that you were dealing with something deadly. I died in Vietnam and didn't even know it. Before his death of cancer at 28, Paul Reutershan succeeded in drawing public attention to veterans who were suffering from illnesses that they believed were caused by exposure to Agent Orange. The military stopped the use of Agent Orange in 1970. In 1979, the Veterans Administration released a film that tried to address veterans' fears. Herbicide or dioxin exposure might cause psychological changes, birth defects, or even cancer. But it is important to remember that right now there is still no definite scientific proof. Several thousand veterans are suing the manufacturers who assert that no medical studies have proven that exposure to Agent Orange is harmful to humans. Many veterans are unconvinced. I think the even more tragic story will come out when we've gotten past our wounded pride and our haughtiness and reestablished relations with the people of Indochina and begin to discover what the after effects have been of the use of uh, poisons like Agent Orange and, and other agents uh, there in that country as an indiscriminate part of the war policy. From 1962 until 1970, the airplane sprayed several times a day. For a period close to a decade, the Vietnamese population below was exposed to the chemical without knowing anything of its impact. It was not until 1970 that they were told of the toxicity of the agent. 
the important thing is to integrate our knowledge about what happened in the United States, as say at Times Beach, with what we believe or know happened in Vietnam, and then do careful research to find out. Eight years after the end of the war, the Veterans Administration was still awaiting further medical evidence before compensating Agent Orange health claims. For many veterans, peace has meant awaiting the outcome of epidemiological studies that will take years to complete, and Agent Orange has become a symbol of deceit and betrayal. In 1981, newly elected President Reagan sounded a fresh note of certainty about America's role in the world. Our forbearance should never be misunderstood. Our reluctance for conflict should not be misjudged as a failure of will. When action is required to preserve our national security, we will act. We will maintain sufficient strength to prevail if need be, knowing that if we do so, we have the best chance of never having to use that strength. The Reagan administration saw Soviet-inspired threats to the nation's security in Central America and stepped up support to friendly governments in the region. In the ensuing debate, the Vietnam analogy was asserted and denied again and again. To tell us that this will not lead us into a mass intervention like it did in Vietnam is to simply uh, repeat the uh, naivete with which we bought the idea that advisors would not get us into trouble in Vietnam. Let me say to those who invoke the memory of Vietnam, there is no thought of sending American combat troops to Central America. They are not needed. I say they are not needed, and indeed, they have not been requested there. All our neighbors ask of us is assistance in training and arms to protect themselves while they build a better, freer life. To begin with, we believe the administration fundamentally misunderstands the causes of conflict in Central America. We cannot afford to found so important a policy on ignorance. And the painful truth is that many of our highest officials seem to know as little about Central America in 1983, as we knew about Indochina in 1963. Thank you, Mr. President. Why not say categorically that Central America will not be another Vietnam, and that under no circumstances will you oppose U.S. troops in a combat situation in Central America? Well, I said the last time we, the, we gathered that uh, there are some things I can make every assurance in the world that we have no such plans, we have no desire, nor do the countries down there want us involved in that way. But I used an expression that has been used by presidents like Franklin Delano Roosevelt and others, and that is that a, uh, a president should never say never. One thing that has changed dramatically since Vietnam has been that Congress has passed a War Powers Act. And that places the onus upon the president, if he decides to commit American forces anywhere in the world, to have support of Congress, hence the American people, within 90 days, or he can be required to withdraw those forces. I don't think we will ever again uh, witness the day when the Congress of the United States is prepared, as it in effect was prior to the Vietnam War, to give the president carte blanche when it comes to the running of American foreign policy. <laughs> An American advisor in Honduras had his own Vietnam legacy to pass on to Salvadoran trainees. Los guerrilleros están usando este método en América Central. Es lo mismo que los guerrilleros estaban usando en Vietnam. Among the war's legacies has been concern that America might take actions with unforeseen consequences in countries like Vietnam, whose realities were unknown or misunderstood. 
There has also been concern that America might abstain from actions it should take out of fear of another Vietnam. But American troops have again been sent abroad to Lebanon and elsewhere, and their leaders have described them as greatly improved. The people that we have today are, are very high-class young men and women. Starting with our officer corps, uh, we've been able to attract high-quality young men and women into ROTC. We now are able to bring into the Army uh, almost all high school graduates. One reason is the economy. Other reasons are that it's not out of favor today to be in the military. And, of course, the president's support for the military has, has been one of the major factors as well. The generation now reaching military age was not born when the Marines first landed in Vietnam. Their father's view of the world was shaped in part by World War II, recalling Munich and how Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and the rest of Europe fell like dominoes before the Nazis. They led America into Vietnam. The youth of the 1960s are the Vietnam generation. Whether they fought the war or fought against it, they can never forget it. And each must now seek its meaning. I mean, as I look back in the war and I try and characterize it, one of the things that stands out is it was a situation where a very small number of people had to bear all the prices and nobody else had to do anything but watch it on television. But people that, that just try to evade things for no reason whatsoever except for their own benefit lose some of that. The war was not fought by the people who were opposed to the war or by their peers in large part. There was a economic injustice is so endemic in the society that it reflect that it's reflected directly in who ends up in the military and particularly who ends up dying in time of war so I was honored to go and the involvement uh, whether it was right or wrong uh, I really don't have any real feelings about it uh, I just wanted to serve my country and where the Marine Corps told me to go I went and try to do my best and um, come home safe to my family, my friends, and to the community in South Boston. But the perception that hurts the Vietnam veteran more than anything else in America is that we lost the war. We being the soldiers, we never lost one major conflict in Southeast Asia, including Tet. We kicked their butts. We would have kicked their butts onto Moscow if the politicians would have let us. I was part of the first delegation of Vietnam veterans to go back to Vietnam. To go back to a place where you have fought a war, believe me, is a profound experience. I like to think about Vietnam as being uh, frozen in time, if you wish, in the minds of so many of the men and women that served there during the war. When our people think about Vietnam, they think about it in terms of a country at war with explosions, with killing, with pain, with suffering, with just an awful lot of anguish. To go back and replace, if you wish, those images with a new look at Vietnam. To see Vietnam as the country, to smell it, to see the rice paddies and the tree lines and the hooches and the people. I think the what I came out of this trip to Vietnam with was an understanding. The most significant thing, I believe, that we could do is make a peace with Vietnam, end the war. The Vietnam generation took a major step toward national reconciliation when the Veterans Memorial was dedicated in November 1982. Sadness, pain, and bitterness were openly expressed. So were strength and compassion. The war memorial to the Vietnam veterans was conceived and brought into being by a small group of veterans whose dedication to serve was just as strong as ever, but what they were serving was the cause of healing.
touch the name. Uh, it may sound trite to, to many people, but uh, the people that I know that died, it meant something to me that that memorial will be here long after I'm gone. That memorial brings with it a great degree of reverence. What happened in the course of that week in Washington, D.C., was extraordinary. The renewed sense of a brotherhood just rekindled, if you wish, the understanding and the awareness and the need to carry on in our work in getting us together. And that with that understanding, hopefully, prevent another Vietnam or anything like it from happening again. The chief legacy of the Vietnam War is an open question, and it's in our country's hands right now. And it is primarily in the hands of the men and women who came of age during the Vietnam War years. It's an open question. America's Vietnam War is over, but it lives on in all those who experienced it. This and all future generations will have to turn to this long, dark and hard chapter of history to define the meaning and determine the lessons of Vietnam. This program was produced by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. This presentation of Vietnam, a television history, is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. Original funding for this series was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, public television stations, the Chubb Group of insurance companies, for over a hundred years providing business and personal insurance worldwide through independent agents and brokers the George D. Smith Fund, the Christopher Reynolds Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and other contributors. Call the toll-free number on your screen to order the complete Vietnam a Television History series on videocassette. This is PBS.